The Biophilic Leadership Summit is the only multi-day conference entirely dedicated to biophilic projects, principles, and research, bringing together the top industry leaders in an intimate, natural setting to network, build partnerships, and learn from each other. This year's summit will explore biophilic placemaking and how we can use biophilic principles to promote health, happiness, and vitality in public spaces. In addition to fascinating presentations, delicious farm-to-table meals at Serenby, and cocktails, this year's summer will feature a selection of biophilic experiences like forest bathing, bird watching, and more. So join us in Serenby for the 6th Annual Biophilic Leadership Summit from March 24th to March 26, 2024. Learn more about the summit and register today at biophilicsummit.com. That's biophilicsummit.com. We hope to see you there. Hey, Jennifer. Hey, Monica. How are you? Well, I'm great. I'm in your neck of the woods for a couple of weeks. We get to hang out in real life for the first time in a really long time. I know it's fabulous. Jennifer, tell us about our guest this week. Okay, so we sat down with Tim Beatley, who is a Teresa Hines Professor of Sustainable Communities in the Department of Urban and Environmental Planning. At the University of Virginia? It seems like a mouthful. (laughs) It's a mouthful, all right. But his extensive body of work is centered around creative ways that cities can become more livable, equitable, and reduce their ecological footprint. In addition to his work at UVA, he's also the founder of Biophilic Cities Network, which is an amazing organization of partner cities from all over the world to build an understanding of how to incorporate nature into urban spaces. We won't list all of Tim's credentials and publications here because that would literally take an entire episode, but we will link them in our show notes. Absolutely. And interestingly, the conversation we had with Tim is not about any of his published work per se. We got our hands on this incredible book proposal from Tim about a concept he calls ethical cities, which at its core is all about moving away from this view of cities as only municipal, political, legal entities and reframing them as having an actual ethical duty. This is focused on Tim's work of bringing nature into cities and the ethics around that, specifically healthcare, racial and gender equity, as well as the qualities and standards for ethical leaders and how we hold those leaders accountable. And all these topics are completely interconnected, of course. Exactly, 100%. And I really hope that that comes across in our conversation. So let's go on to our interview with Tim Beatley. Sounds great. Tim, hi, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? We are great. You. Thank you so much for joining us today. So excited. Um, sure. Yeah, right. We're just, we've been yeah. talking about this for a week. So if you don't mm-hmm. mind, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. So I teach uh, here at the University of Virginia in the School of Architecture, actually in the Department of Urban and Environmental Planning. That's my primary role. I've been here for uh, more than 30 years years, actually, teaching um, undergrads and grads um, about planning. It's, that's the primary thing. I also do other things that I know we're going to talk about, uh, like uh, help to run a, a network of cities called Biophilic Cities. You tell us a little bit about Biophilic Cities. We had you on the Serenby Stories podcast, and you shared quite a bit. But for this new audience, um, what is a, what is the network about? Yeah. So, well, so the network started in around 2013. It really grew out of a research project. We had some funding from the Summit Foundation in Washington, D.C. Um, we were looking at w- what were the really innovative things that cities were doing around the world to, to bring nature into their cities, to put nature at the center of their design and planning. And at the end of that uh, project, we brought representatives from 10 cities to uh, Charlottesville uh, here in Virginia. And at the end of a four-day meeting, this group just wanted to continue to meet and to continue as a community. And so we sort of informally started the network then. Um, and since then, it's been growing. Uh, so so it, it has biophilia, really, at the core. I know you're, you're, uh, the folks who are listening to your podcast already know a lot about biophilia, but this innate connection to nature that we uh, we want to need. Um, and our argument is that, that if we're going to design cities, um, we're going to be increasingly an urbanized planet. We have to really put nature at the center of, of that design and planning. And, and nature can't just be something that you, you visit um, a couple of times a year on vacation. It has to be all around us where we're living and, and working. So 
So we're up to about 25 cities now officially in the network as partner cities. And I can talk more about what that means. Um, but we also have several, we have uh, three or 4,000 individual members of the network and several hundred organizations uh, part of the network as well. And what time frame has it grown from that small size to the size it is now? Well, it's been since 2013. So what is that, seven or eight years? And it's, um, it, we're not uh, C40, we're not ICLI, we're, you know, we're a, a relatively small, very much a vision-driven network. So these are people who are really embrace this idea of cities of immersive nature. Um, and so it is not a network for everyone. And, um, and, and so we've been happy with the slow percolation. And in more recent years, it's sort of a little bit more accelerated um, traction that we've, we've been uh, getting. But it's probably, you know, um, still going to be a small network even as we grow. Sure. Um, so one of the things when we had you on Serenity Stories that kind of blew me away and, and you just thought this was so funny, but I was like at the end of our conversation, what I said sort of like, you know, dropped this bomb, this topic <laughs> of something <laughs> called what what was fascinating to me and it still is, is ethical cities. And yeah. I, I didn't know what that was and I had never heard that. And um, I'm just thrilled that we're having you back because that's what I want to dig into today is sort of like, what is an ethical city? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's great. I don't fully really know. Years, I mean, whatever, yeah, whatever I say today, I want to be clear. This is um, an emerging idea. And um, I mean, the first thing to wonder about is can a city be ethical? Is that, mm. is that something that even makes sense to, to talk about it? Right. At the, at the level of a city, of a, of a municipality or a, a government. We think about people, individuals being being ethical. But uh, so the first thing I would say is that city, it is possible and it may be a little provocative, but that's part of the goal here is to begin mm-hmm. uh, to, to think about the ways that um, a city advances particular um, values and, and mm-hmm. policies and the ways that cities um, at a collective level, level through policy decisions that city councils make, uh, policies that are administered and enforced by staff, all those things um, have ethical implications. Um, and so in that way, in the same way that we talk about a, a corporation being ethical or responsible or a university for that matter being ethical or responsible, we can also talk about about a city. Well, and that's yeah. an actually a really good point because to your point that, you know, obviously we think of people being ethical, but we do hold universities and institutions accountable. Mm-hmm. And so taking it to a yes. city is a really compelling idea. Um, Absolutely. And a big endeavor. It's like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a big endeavor. Um, and I, I, you, you all have seen my outline of a book that I've been working on. And yes. there are so many different aspects of what you might be included in a discussion about about the ethics of cities. And it's um, how we treat the environment and the things we do um, that affect other forms of life. Uh, that mm. co-occupy spaces with us in, in cities. It's how we treat each other. It's how uh, it's the, you know, all of the, the issues of uh, systemic racism uh, and segregated land use policies that we're grappling with in American cities today are, are at the core ethical uh, issues. Um, mm. uh, the policing issues that are, you know, that we're grappling with right now, those are all deeply ethical issues, but it also has to do with um, ha- you know, privacy and how we how we manage uh, public spaces in in cities. How open and inclusive those cities are. Uh, how tolerant are they to to diversity diversities of uh, lifestyle and, and and perspective? So, so there's so many aspects to what might constitute an ethical city. You're absolutely right. I have a question. So is biophilia an entryway to an ethical city? Like, is that the key component of why you'd want to create an ethical city? Yeah. Yeah. I think it is. There are, um, of course, a a, a lot of really rich uh, issues there for us to grapple with. I Mm -hmm. do think that um, my my vision of a biophilic city, uh, a city that connects us to nature, that cares about nature, literally biophilia, love of nature, 
um, is a point of entree for thinking about a whole bunch of things that have ethical implications. So um, I do believe, I just said this, that, that we have a responsibility to think about the other forms of life we co-occupy the world with, and many of them are sentient forms of life. So I've been writing a lot lately about this idea of a bird-friendly city. And so we know um, the way we build buildings and the emphasis on, on glass creates incredible danger uh, for birds. And, and estimates suggest that upwards of a billion birds are killed. No. Uh, in, in the U.S. alone, a billion wow. birds. These are by, sentient creatures. By buildings. By buildings. And, and, wow. and, uh, oh and, and many, many more harmed, uh, injured mm. uh, by, by buildings and by, by glass specifically. So do we, are we ethically uh, bound? Are we duty bound to think about the, the way we design buildings, uh, taking into account the, the incredible pain and suffering, mm. um, that birds, uh, uh, feel? Um, and I think, yes, we do. A- absolutely we do. And, and, uh, counterbalanced against the relatively easy and, uh, clear and relatively cost effective things that we could do. And, and are beginning to do to minimize that pain and suffering. That's a, that's an ethical duty. Um, and, and to me, it's part of the, the vision of a biophilic city. We're a city. We want nature around us because it, it's good for us. We're often sort of justifying, uh, trees and, and nature and birds and birdsong because of all the benefits they, they, they bring us. But there's also, we're also, we have to acknowledge the inherent moral worth, the intrinsic value that other forms of life like birds have and we are duty bound to, to minimize the, the pain and suffering they feel. So, so we've got cities, uh, in our network, uh, now San Francisco, the first, um, American city to mandate, uh, bird, bird safe design and bird safe. Really? Design. Yeah. Um, so we're quite, quite proud of San Francisco. Other cities are, are following suit. Actually, Toronto, um, is now in our network and they, they really were a pioneering city and the first city really in North America to have adopted, um, bird safe standards mm-hmm. and they gradually ratcheted them up. A city that, that cares a lot about birds. Right. Well, in, in, in your book, um, proposal, which you're, you're writing it, right? This isn't just a yeah, idea halfway, in your head. <laughs> right. No, no, about halfway through it. And it, and it actually, um, I, for many, many years here at UVA, I, taught an environmental ethics uh, course. Um, and so it's it's been a part of what I've done and what I've thought about and been writing about for, for many years, like really from the beginning of my uh, career. And I and back in the 90s, mid-90s, I wrote a book called Ethical Land Use, a, a Johns Hopkins Press book that, that um, it, at the time um, w- was a lot about environment, but it wasn't so much about cities. Mm-hmm. So, this however many years later that is all these ideas continue to percolate and uh and so this is the book really in some ways more comprehensive about Mm -hmm. all those ethical dimensions or most of those ethical dimensions Mm -hmm. well and i think you bring up a good point that everything is so interconnected you know the city as a system right um and beyond um you know a city you know cities are permeable right it's not Mm -hmm. there's not a bubble on it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so what happens in a city affects regions and affects states and affects countries and beyond. And I think we've seen that this past year with not only the pandemic, but with, you know, what with climate change, right? This isn't a city issue. It's a human issue. Um, So I I feel like um, this book, you know, when it comes out, what is it? um, I think you'd mentioned you have to deliver it this summer or so. (laughs) Yeah. But what's well, the timing? Right. Because I, I feel like the world uh, needs this conversation now. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying that. And I, I have a lot, a lot more writing still, still to do. But, uh, but yeah, hopefully it'll be done uh, this, this summer. Uh, yeah. Your, your point is a good one. And, and c- cities are, um, you know, not they are just they are connected to the world. And this is one of the points that we make when we talk about eth- ethical cities. In, in philosophy, there are, there are kind of a couple of, of key ideas that, that I find really powerful. One of them is the notion of moral, the moral imagination. 
the, mm -hmm. the ability of us as human beings to put ourselves in someone else's circumstance mm -hmm. um, and to, to imagine what it might like, what it might be like to be a homeless person, for example, or not mm -hmm. be able to feed your, your family and the circumstances leading to, 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 the, to that, you know, to that place. Uh, similarly, the ability to understand or appreciate, we may not be able to know exactly what it, or, or anything about what it's like to be a bird, but we do know uh, suffering and pain, pain mm. and suffering. And, and the, so, so that's a big part of this. The second related idea is the concept of the moral community, which means what, who, who or what are the things that, have, that ought to be given moral consideration in mm. thinking about uh, our ethical uh, choices and ethical decisions. And, and so we frequently talk about one dimension being biological, and that, that means expanding the moral community to include other forms of life. And I embrace a kind of biocentrism that says that everything, uh, every living thing has, has inherent moral worth and we need to take, take its interest into account. But an another dimension is uh, geographical. Mm -hmm. so the idea that we define an ethical city in part by uh, it, its efforts to think beyond its borders. So we know, as you suggest, um, cities are a big driver of, of greenhouse gas emissions, of, of carbon mm -hmm. emissions, and, and, and at the same time can do many things to reduce those emissions that will address the, you know, the impacts are often far away. Um, and it's flooding in Bangladesh or sure. you know, there are parts of the world that are especially vulnerable to, to the, you know, what, what we've done, the patterns of emissions here in the global north, especially. So cities can be uh, taking responsibility and can be quickly moving in the direction of reducing their carbon footprints and and doing things uh, that take into account that, that seek to take responsibility for and minimize the impacts beyond their borders. Um, and that can be something you know smaller. It can be uh, uh, you know figuring out what you're doing things that might um, minimize impact on an adjacent you know city. Mm -hmm. or, um, so it isn't, doesn't have to be far away mm -hmm. geographically, but that's, that's another way we think about an ethical city. It, it, the, the impacts of the choices, the decisions made within a city's boundaries don't stop. They don't stop at that boundary. They're mm -hmm. beyond it. And by the way, the third, the third dimension is temporal, um, that an ethical city is one that is thinking long term and thinking in um, a kind of deeper, deeper time and thinking about the impacts on future generations and thinking about what it means uh, to be a good and a good ancestor. There's actually mm -hmm. a uh, new new book. Roman Chris Chris Narek has got has written this great book about what it about. Um, what does it mean to be a, a good ancestor? Thing. What's it called? Uh, that's the title. Um, oh, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, I'll give you the full title, The Good Ancestor, A Radical Prescription for Long-Term Thinking. It's a wow. 2020 book, and I'm actually just, just reviewing it for the oh, great. Uh, Journal of the American Planning Association. Um, it's well, just you... wonderful. And as, a, as an urban planner, uh, he, what he, one of the things he says is we haven't, we don't have a very, we don't have very good ways of, of thinking about the future, very good uh, sort of uh, patterns for thinking, or very good tools for thinking about the future, and 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 this book is all about that. Anyway, one of the one of the ideas he talks about a legacy mindset, mm -hmm. um, and thinking, and and this idea of uh, each generation thinking about what it's going to leave for mm -hmm. future generations, and the idea of giving gifts and passing things along. This is not there's really nothing in this book that's brand new, but he talks about it and and pulls it together in a really impressive way. But but that is another dimension. Um, are, do, do people living in a hundred years or five hundred years are they part of our moral community? Do cities need to be thinking mm -hmm. about that? And I would say yes, they do. I have a question. Do you think because of COVID, these conversations are much more uh, people are much more aware of them, or are there's more people want to have these conversations more than they would have pre-COVID. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, certainly uh, during COVID, we have appreciated, you know, the, the power of nature. That's mm. something that's undeniable. Um, and I'm often 
uh, lately with this bird, bird friendly city book that is kind of the newest book of mine. I've been doing a lot of, a lot of, um, presentations to bird clubs and, <laughs> which is really cool. Some I of understand that. Big yeah. and some are <laughs> tiny, you know, it might be 15, 20 people. And, and I get all of these kind of anecdotal uh, stories about how people are paying attention to, to things like birds, watching birds and putting up bird feeders and listening to birds in a way they didn't maybe before the pandemic. And, and so mm-hmm. I think there is, um, an appreciation for, for nature, the power of nature, the constancy of nature, that that, for a lot of us, that has been a, a really important point of normalcy for mm-hmm. us in a, in a crazy, otherwise crazy mixed up world right now. So I think there's a, there's a point of entree there, um, in talking about how, what we want cities to be, how we, what we want them to be like in the future. And the idea that they're more natureful and more biophilic, I think that is gaining support because of the pan- pandemic. But more broadly, the discussion about meaning and purpose and ethics, and I suspect you're right about that as well, because um, we've we've lost, you know, more than a half a million lives in this pandemic, and we've had a lot of people's lives have been turned upside down and you know i think there's a for a lot of us there is a kind of deeper uh soul searching maybe that this has helped to to stimulate and that maybe we we will be looking for greater meaning and purpose and and importance in what we do and how we live yeah some um i know you had written a few years back um and i and i kind of pulled this one thing out of an article that um it brought to my attention something called the compassion charter um that's sort of a a really powerful document that cities can sort of pledge um to sort of be a compassionate city and i know in this article this is now two years on um two million people in 70 cities um including like tucson denver rotterdam cape town had sort of signed on and it was sort of an idea of like how can we create um policies planning um and environmental action that talks about compassion and i thought that that sort of you know, probably plays into this idea of um, an ethical city. And and I'll just sort of add on to that. And another word of like flourishing was also something, a word that you used. So talk a little bit about that. I just, I I think it's, you you don't usually think of ethical, maybe compassion, but flourishing is, you know, maybe sits in this health and wellness world and maybe nature ties to it. But talk to me about that. Like when you have an ethical city, the citizens can flourish. Right. I think that's right. Uh, um, and that's actually w- one of the ar- side arguments of, of made by this what, book about what it means to be a good ancestor is that this is mm. uh, part partly about m- seeking meaning in life. And mm-hmm. uh, when you think about what is really important to us, it, it is about passing along um, a planet that that will be that will allow for uh, deep deep flourishing of all life, human uh, mm-hmm. included. But yeah, the the compassionate charter um, I think is really really an interesting way of giving some visibility to to that idea. Um, mm-hmm. that it's um, the importance of empathy, compassion. You know, is sort of taking empathy and, and, and acting on it in a, in a way that's how some, some have described that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and he, in the thing was sort of this idea of like, you know, you may not, we not, we may not all look the same. We may live in yeah. different parts of town. Right. We have different economic situations, but we're all interconnected for a common fate. And I thought that right. was really great too. Cause I think that goes back, I, I, you know, I'll go back on the pandemic or in climate and I'm almost would add, you know, you know, with so much um, divisiveness around, you know, politics, you know, we Mm. all as humans have common life goals, right? Like we want Mm -hmm. safety. We want our kids to be well-educated. We want food on the table. You know, we want a job or a role in the community with purpose. So I I really like this idea of, um, going back and like a softer, more compassionate way to think about the world. 
and cities which are so bustling and like hardscape, if you think, you know. Yeah. So yes. uh, I, I love that. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I do too. I think it's it, uh, and we don't talk about this um, en- enough. Um, we're frequently um, talking about cities in, in terms of their the GDP or the economic you know, cities or economic engines and how much how much job, jobs do they produce and and um, you know we, we we focus on as as we need to on the mechanics of running cities and planning cities and zoning you know decisions and all the things that we kind of grapple with in terms of city management city planning we tend to forget that those those, those larger values um, and and yeah flourishing is a big part of that and and compassion is a big part of that and and compassion for Dan I would say um, thinking about these these different ways of thinking about our mor- moral community it's com- compassion um, for for other other forms of life um, is is a big part of that um, as well. Um, can we talk like concrete examples? Um, <laughs> and not to say, no, because sure. I love this. And I think it's, yeah. I think it's something that um, just to put it out in the world and have somebody start thinking that this concept exists and like, what does that mean? I think is phenomenal. Yeah. Like, talk, let's talk a little bit about like concrete examples or ways that a city can be ethical. And, um, you know, you talk about public spaces and the public realm a lot. Right. Um, right. Tell me a little bit about, tell us a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah. So, so I would say, you know, an ethical city is a just and inclusive city. I would say it's an open city. It's a city that is tolerant, again, of different ways of living, uh, of of diversity. Um, It is a city that um, in, in, in urban design circles, we talk a lot about um, the value, the importance of public spaces, right? That these are the places where, um, if we're doing it right, they are the, the places where we come together, whatever our differences are, whatever our backgrounds, our ethnicity, whatever, we come together uh, in those spaces. And that is how, how we uh, begin to see that diversity and, and, and connect and become a, a city, a kind of um, cohesive city, if, if you will. So um, there are a lot of things that have to do with how we plan those spaces. And so uh, one of our partner cities, just as an, as an example, Portland, Oregon, in the, in the Biflake Cities uh, network, we, we have a, a five or seven minute film about uh, Cully Park. This is a park in a, in a um, diverse a neighborhood, an underserved neighborhood that didn't have a, a park. And um, it's a wonderful model, actually, of how instead of having a, a top-down parks department design a park, um, you, we, actually the neighborhood uh, is, is given that power. And Beautiful. So it becomes a space that they own and that they care about and that they are comfortable in. And, uh, and that is a, a, a real problem in a lot of cities um, where you have... And have a, access to parks is a, a huge uh, social equity uh, problem. But even when you have a, a, a park n- nearby for a neighborhood of color may not feel um, comfortable or safe in, in that uh, space. So um, there are many things like the Cully Park example, many ways that we can do things differently and, and share the power and co-design spaces in a, in a, more, a more ethical way and inclusive uh, kind, kind of way. So that's a, that's a one concrete example. Um, you know, we, we are, of course, in the midst of rethinking everything in spaces, in, including um, the racist monuments, right? That's mm-hmm. uh, been a big thing, um, and it's been a, a real point of contention here in my own city mm. of, uh, of Charlottesville. Sure. Um, and so... Um, and, and the, and the people we name things for, right. And, the uh, and the imagery that we find, um, uh, integrated into the spaces and public realm, mm-hmm. uh, all those things have a bearing on how inclusive and safe and comfortable, um, uh, we all feel in those spaces. And, uh, and so, um, that's one set of concrete 
ways that we could make a city more uh, more ethical. Uh, but again, back to my example of bird safe design. I mean, there, there are a whole bunch of things that concrete steps that we can take to uh, create cities that that allow for coexistence. And mm. Coexistence to me is a really important ethical uh, concept, and that means birds, but it also means thinking about you know coyotes and um, mm -hmm. other other kinds of nature that you know may may represent an element of danger even for residents but how we navigate that and how we care and treat how we treat those other forms of life um are really important and really parts of again part of um what what constitutes a, an ethical city on the on the temporal um d dimension thinking about a, an ethical city is one that that thinks about what it's passing along. Mm. Uh, we have many concrete examples of cities, some, some cities that are bad examples because they've done things that simply pass along problems, um, whether that's a toxic waste dump or um, a, a car, uh, uh, excessively car dependent transportation system, for example. Or, mm. um, but we, on the other, on the other hand, we have a lot of really wonderful examples. There's no perfect city. Let's be sure. clear about that. I can't give you a, a list of the ethical cities, um, <laughs> but uh, Phoenix, Arizona, Phoenix is is uh, is in our um, uh, biophilic cities network, and uh, as an example, in the 20s, 1920s, the city had the chance to purchase. Um, 14,000 acres that that became the South Mountain Park. Hmm. This is a desert park, essentially, you know, largely untouched uh, landscape. Um, 1924, um, and they, they spent a fair amount of money to buy this, what's now a beloved and incredibly large desert park, desert preserve. Hmm. That's the gift um, that, yes, they enjoyed it, um, residents enjoyed it, and it was actually quite a quite a ways away from the city when they when they did this. Um, but but today's residents um, are enjoying that that what is that a hundred years later? This is this is a this is a gift mm -hmm. that that current residents are uh, really benefiting from, and so I think that's part of it's, it's part of the mindset, part of a, a mm -hmm. way a city sees. Um, every decision in terms of how it's going to affect the, um, you know, many, many future residents who are not, not even uh, born yet. I mean, how, how, and how do you incorporate that, their voice into, into the decision-making of a city is a really interesting and important question for us. It's beautiful. One of the things that I, it, you'd also mentioned or in, in the, in the book proposal is that, you know, we, um, or cities, you know, set out to do planning and maybe the long term, the long range planning is 20 years, 30 years. But yeah. what if we thought about 500 years out, which seems mind boggling, right? But yeah. I do think that that's how do we stop the short term ism, mm -hmm. if that's a word? Yeah. Um, and think, it is, it is. you know, think yeah. further out. Um, one thing um, that I um, know that you've said before is that, you know, tree canopy, um, mm. you know, in, and again, tree canopy, we love those neighborhoods with all of the tree line streets yeah. and obviously that have parks. Um, but trees are not just beautiful and provide shade. Um, there's a life expectancy differential with neighborhoods with greater trees. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? I mean, that's that's an ethical issue, I think. It is. It, it absolutely is. And I and I said that um, you know, an ethical city is a just and inclusive city, a, a, a city that thinks about the fairness uh, in the distribution of 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 uh, benefits and and mm -hmm. and also the the costs. Of, you know, bad the goods and the bads, and mm -hmm. those are distributive. Those are ethical issues, but. When it comes mm -hmm. to nature, um, trees included, mm -hmm. um, we like to say that you know nature is a birthright. Um, it's not something that only one uh, part of a city should get to enjoy. Mm -hmm. And as you say, um, the, that that imbalance or that that uh, uh, unfair distribution has has pretty pretty significant health implications. So um, in many cities, one of our cities, Richmond, Virginia. 
one of the cities in our network, you, you can line up, you can overlay the, the redlining, 1930s redlining maps. Oh, wow. And predict pretty much uh, the present tree canopy cover. And so it is, you know, a, a sharp imbalance um, between um, the largely African-American neighborhoods that have a lo low tree canopy cover and the white, leafy, white, affluent neighborhoods of the city. So there's a huge uh, social inequity, social, uh, you know, injustice there that, that has, you know, very clear health implications. And, and as you say, uh, pretty severe, pretty sharp differences in life expectancy. Um, and in some cities like Chicago, the difference is 20 years or more. I mean, it's 20 it's years. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, so, Ugh. um, this, this is profoundly unjust. And, mm -hmm. um, and so how can you have an ethical city, uh, that, it, uh, is tolerant of, of that, that injustice? Um, so cities like Richmond, uh, to their credit, and there's a, a wonderful mayor, LeVar Stoney, who's kind of made this a priority and, and he is, um, investing in, in new parks and new nature in those underserved neighborhoods, it's largely neighborhoods of color. So actually this past fall, he, um, announced five new parks, which is sort of unheard of in a, in a, in a city, an older city. So, we can and must uh, ad address those inequities and those injustices. So, so nature is a is is certainly um, a really important thing to to think about. the The benefits of of nature, the pleasures of nature, ought to be enjoyed by everybody. Well, speaking of that, are you? I mean, are you going to think about hiring like chief ethical officers in certain cities, or like how would that be mapped out? Um, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. We do have now. We're in this era where there are a, a lot of new new titles mm. and and new positions in cities, which is kind of kind of interesting. So there's a, you know, there's now a chief resilience officer. Usually, there's something mm -hmm. out of the hundred resilient cities, and and there are sustainability directors. And you know, 10, 15 years ago, that there didn't there weren't titles like that, and now there there is increasingly uh, a chief inclusion, equity, and inclusion officer. I know that that's a title that we're finding in many, in many cities now. And that's really positive. That's really a good, a good thing. Um, there are some cities that have hired ethicists. So um, that's really an interesting idea, right? That you might actually have, in addition to having a parks director and a, you know, city manager and a plant, you know, that you have a, a city ethicist wow. um, who is maybe sitting at the end of that, you know, city council chamber who, you know, just as there's the city attorney, right, that is consulted all the time, you know, when something, when a legal issue comes up, maybe, maybe they, they turn to the chief ethics officer <laughs> or the city ethicist and say, what do you think, what are the ethical dimensions of this? And oh, so, you know, what are the, um, and that, that's that, as I say, this is not a, that's not a new idea. And there are some cities that have hired ethicists. That's a wonderful idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, as we sort of wrap up our conversation, cause you know, Tim, I could talk to you forever. Um, yes. <laughs> tell us, you know, one of the things we like to sort of let people know, you know, what actions can they take themselves, um, whether they live like in a city, a town, a rural area, you know, to help advocate for an ethical city standard. Because that's, I think, one of the big things that as consumers, what we can do is, um, you know, educate and, and right. then advocate and put pressure on um, our neighborhoods and city councils. So tell us some examples or thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I think there there are um, many things that you could do as an individual, and so I've, I've been, made a big point about um, making that an ethical city is a is a city that emphasizes coexistence and and uh, thinks about birds and bird safety, for for example. And so there are many many things that you could do as an individual. I mentioned bird safe glass, for example. Um, yeah, about forty. 40 to 50% of the bird uh, uh, fatalities happen actually in residential areas. You know, that single family home that you're living in. Mm -hmm. um, oh no. There's a lot of windows. <laughs> there are actually things you could do uh, and products actually, um, paracords and 
relatively low cost uh, off the shelf products that you could do to make your your house more bird friendly. Uh, bird Maybe safe. also cat. Get rid of your cat. And the cat. Oh, the whole. That's a whole. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to get in uh, trouble Monica, with the cat. Just to, said that. You're going to have to have a sh- whole podcast. I'm going to get in trouble. Cat. Yeah. Uh, because how do you balance our love of birds against our love of cats? And sure. you know, have a lot of there are rainbow collars and there are catios and there are all kinds of things that you could do. Uh, catio is a cat patio, which we have a little film about catios. So, okay, great. We'll you know. put that on the website. Anyway, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> I, so I think there's so things you could do at, at sort of the individual level. But of course, a lot of the things that I'm, I've am i been talking about are, are things that could happen at, at the municipal level or the city mm-hmm. level of a city council. And um, I think that we've got to be uh, all of us more engaged in mm-hmm. the political system and more engaged in the processes of making decisions. And I, I don't think that the bird safe, uh, mandatory bird safe ordinance in San Francisco or the one that passed now in New York City happened. It didn't happen without a lot of advocacy. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, it's New York Autobahn and, you know, it's groups, but it's also a lot of individuals expressing um their support and their their desire to see that kind of change and that's so 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 true um so being getting involved yeah. in, in in local politics is a really good thing to do and yeah. and supporting and putting forward candidates that think about ethics um we haven't talked at all about the ethics connected to the processes by which we make decisions but that's a really big part of what makes an ethical city, how, how those decisions are made, who gets to be involved in that process. Mm-hmm. What about the, the unfortunate power of money and campaign contributions and self-dealing and the, the role of, of, of sure. development developers and corporations who have, I think, a, a, a little too much power over those decisions. How do we make sure that they are fair decisions and uh, those are all really important kind of uh ways of setting um ethical rules if you will for for uh, for decisions and decision making so uh there are those kind of things that um that residents can be involved in i think just talking you know having discussions about what it means to live in an ethical city i mean i that to me um you started by by raising this question, what is it? That, that's provocative. Mm-hmm. I don't hear. There's not too many people talking about that. What the ethics of a city? I think we need to we need to um, kind of uh, pull the curtain aside and and start to explicitly question the ethics of a lot of the things we're doing in cities and apply a kind of lens, an ethical lens, to things that we haven't before and talk about them in that way um right. this is not just a decision that um reaches some kind of reaches a a, um, a legal standard or is cost effective or whatever the usual standards are um but we should hold our decisions to a higher level and talk about them again through through this sort of ethical way I think that's fantastic. And since we can't audit your class, which, you know, I'm like, I'm advocating mm. for, I want to come audit your class. Um, the book will be the next best thing. So when, when, when are we hoping that yeah, we'll be able to get I our hands on you, it? I have to finish it first. Okay. Yes. We'll have you back for the book. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. I'd love to come back. Well, Tim, this was amazing. Yeah. Thank, yeah, you thank you so much. Um, we again, we're just gonna keep bringing you back and talk and dig in further because okay. there's so many aspects of this that we haven't even covered. But I do think we've really connected to nature and the biophilic lens. So thank mm-hmm. you, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having. Me. Thank you for your knowledge, your wisdom, and your time. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, that was so great. If only we lived in this world of ethical and biophilic cities. I have to say, I'm pretty optimistic. Just to have these thought leaders like Tim putting these ideas out into the world, 
putting pen to paper, hopefully will generate energy and start the conversation on how we can make cities more ethical. I think it's something people are really craving right now. Monica, I love what you said during our conversation about how when you have an ethical city, citizens can flourish. I mean, Tim said he can't give us a list of ethical cities, but it seems like there is this general sense that people and citizens are starting to really demand a society that's empathetic, healthy, safe, where we just recognize each other's basic humanity. 2020 was a lightning rod of a year with the pandemic, the election, racial reckoning, the protests against police brutality. I really hope we can take stock from all these experiences and channel it into a working way to build society that is more ethical, more empathetic. I mean, it's not going to be easy, but it'll be really worth it. It'd be so worth it. Was there anything that surprised you, though? Yeah, some of the concepts were pretty new to me. When he talks about nature and biophilia, I don't think we always talk about animal life mm. um, and what an ethical obligation we do. We have to those animals also to provide more than an access to nature and green space. We have to cut admissions. We have to take those living creatures into consideration. Mm -hmm. And I also really like the idea of creating a 500 year plan into the future. Yeah. It seems so radical, right? But it's so different from the kind of short term city planning we're used to. But imagine what the world would be like if that was a common practice. It's all so fascinating. A lot to think about. Step one is becoming more engaged with what's going on in your local community advocating, helping put forward the right leaders who really, truly care about these issues. And get an ethicist on the city's payroll. Wasn't that so cool? Yeah. And yes, buy Tim's book when it comes out. We'll let you know. Okay, Jennifer, we'll be back in a few weeks with another Biophilic Solutions interview. Do you want to go meet for a drink? Absolutely. Let's do it. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.